Welcome back to the podcast. Don't forget to go to the website at retireyoungaudio.com and leave us a comment. Also, subscribe to the Retire Young Podcast at Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. Welcome to the big show. It's the Retire Young Radio Show. If you're a first-time listener, thanks for stopping by. I am your host, Joshua David, and we are happy to have you with us today. Once again, I have my great friend and my tag team partner, and I know you've waited all week for this. Al, oh, how you doing? All week. Yeah, you know, I'm doing great. How about you, Josh? It's really good. It's always great to be back helping our retire young family make better investing decisions. we got a real big show today that we're going to be playing, and we're going to talk about financial literacy, Al. A lot of people are just unsure with what's happening in these, in these financial markets, how the institutions trade, how the markets work, and they're also unsure about other asset classes other than the stock market. So before we do a lot of that stuff, I want to get into these current market conditions. There's a lot of volatility continuing, some great moves in the market, and just give me your uh, your, your your description on what's happening in these financial markets with that, but why is the economy kind of driving some of that? And there's a, there's a disconnect, though. Well, yeah, there there has been, you know, and, and probably one of the bigger disconnects that we've seen. The, the economy has had, you know, some abysmal uh, reports, but the market just keeps going up, and and you know things are starting to change a bit now. Um, the the economy just reopened basically this last week, and and that's kind of what we've been looking for. Um, this is an this is unprecedented times for most of us. Most of us have never seen a pandemic like this, and and I'm not sure that there's anybody around that has ever seen an economic recovery post pandemic. I got to ask you though. I I asked you last weekend, but uh, you weren't around during the Spanish flu, were you? Well, I'm not going to say whether I was or no, or not, <laughs> but I don't have much of a recollection for it if I if I was. But you know, there's a lot of hope out there. There's hope for a vaccine, but the the durability of this recent rally really depends on what happens now with the opening of the recovery or the economy. I'm sorry, and and we have to remember that consumer spending accounts for seventy percent of our economic activity. In other words, uh, consumer spending comprises 70% of GDP. So we're really reliant on the consumer to come back in in an active way to to keep this uh, this rally going. And there's been some things that are different this time. You know, typically we see the the leaders coming out of something like this being um the the financials and the uh and the cyclicals. And that's not happened. What's been leading this and really has led the the recovery since 2008 has been big tech and then recently uh, pharmaceutical companies. So, you know, things have, have been changing a bit. And what's really driving the market, it's not retail traders, it's the institutional activity. And you kind of mentioned that earlier. And, and really, that's what drives the market the majority of the time. So it's important for anyone who wants to participate to understand, number one, what causes prices to move. And really, it's institutional activity. And, and what the institutions are doing is they're impacting the the balance between supply and demand. And, and they have enough clout to do that on a regular basis. Let's talk about that for a second, because the average investor thinks that the public is driving the markets. And, and it's the big money, the big dollars, the Buffets, the Goldman Sachs, sure. the, the Merrill Lynch. They're moving these markets. But Let's talk about how the institutions trade and also why are so many people looking to understand how the institutions trade, but also why they do that? Well, I think people are are finally realizing that the institutions are successful on pretty much on a consistent basis with their trading, the trading part of their business. And, and people want to know why that's the case. You know, and, and it gets back to the supply and demand. The institutions have enough clout, enough money. You know, we got we were talking about some of these firms. Uh, J.P. Morgan, uh, Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, some of these firms have maybe trillions of dollars that they can deal with. And, and you know, I would love to say that, Josh, you and I could make a trade and, and impact the market, but but that's not that's it not the case. Warren billions Buffett and can billions probably do of dollars. It. Yeah, and we're talking about maybe millions of shares coming into uh, either in, into a position where their um, institutions are making an entry or an exit. You know, so there's two different areas there, and it really is gets back down to that supply and demand relationship, and that the the move the movement of price in any market, all of the markets, really is dependent upon that. Yeah, and let's so let's talk about supply and demand. I mean, think of supply and demand, and like you like you said, Alan, any market, but also in the financial markets, think of it as an auctioneer. If there's an auctioneer selling a, I don't know, I got a cup of coffee here. Let's just say it's a six dollar cup of coffee, and they're going to start the bidding at at two dollars. There's going to be a lot of people bidding on that, and then they're going to continue to raise that price until there's one buyer exactly. for this cup of coffee. So that's more demand than supply. Once there's more supply, 
price will go down, and that's exactly how the financial markets work. Sure, it, 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 any financial market doesn't make any difference what it is. Real estate, <clears throat> coffee, anything. It, it's that and we love our coffee. That, we do love our coffee. We, in fact, you were sitting here with big cups of coffee in front of us right now, <laughs> and and we probably will continue to do that throughout the day. There'll be another fill-up. <clears throat> but you know, in, in in the financial markets, what we're talking about. It, it, when we're talking about demand, that was, that's buyers. When we're talking about supply, that is sellers. So just look at it this way. What if what if there was an area uh, of price where there were maybe uh, 800,000 or a million shares ready to come in at that price to buy? If that happens, that has to move the price of something. And then uh, conversely, if there are maybe a million shares that are ready to be sold at a certain price, that that's a huge amount of supply that comes in that's going to impact the price of something in a different direction. So the, the, what I'm getting at here is that the, the key is to understand what moves the price of something. What's the engine that drives the price movement? And it's the institutional activity. So it, it really becomes important if you're going to uh, participate in these markets to understand that, first of all, and then try to anticipate uh, when that's going to happen. You, you can't do that by just guessing or, or hoping, and and you really can't figure out why the institutions are, are doing something. It really doesn't make any difference. That really doesn't doesn't impact us. We don't need to know, and we probably never will know, because the institutions have uh, data and research that we just don't have. So it's important not not just to try to understand why they're doing something, just know that they're going to do it and then follow them, copy them. That's the great thing about this, Josh. It's possible to do that. There are strategies that the the individual investor can use that are strategies you can use in an up market, strategies you can use in a down market, and, and again, it's dependent upon that institutional activity. And that's right. A lot of investors trade in one direction. You said people are hoping to uh, you know get in positions that work for them. Well, the markets do have those three directions. They go up, they go down, and they go sideways. So you do need a strategy for every market condition. And that's that whole buy and hold strategy that most investors are in. They buy and hope it goes up. Well, you want to have a strategy for the down markets and the sideways markets as well. And Al, we talk a lot about financial literacy and financial, I guess people are just looking to be more financially literate in their life as well. So Al, we got to, we got to refill our coffee cups because we've got a lot of, a lot of stuff to talk about today. We're going to get into more about the institutional trading, how these financial markets work. We're going to get into the 401k IRAs. We're also going to talk about multiple asset classes, stock options, Futures and Forex. There's things that pe- most people get into, Al, that's mutual funds. We're going to talk about an alternative to mutual funds. Josh and Al with the Retire Young Radio Show. We will be right back. Thanks for listening. And don't forget to go to the website at retireyoungaudio.com and drop us a line. 